Stop being boring. Yeah, you. Boring is easy. Everybody can be boring, but you're better than that. Life is not a game, people. Life isn't a cereal either. Well, it is a cereal. And if life is a game, aren't we on the same team? I mean, really, right? I'm on your team. Be on my team. This is life, people. We got air coming through your nose. We got heartbeat. That means it's time to do something. A poem. Two roads diverged in the woods, and I took the road less traveled. It hurt, man! You look bad. Rocks, boards, and glass? The fire broke! Wah! Not cool, Robert Frost. But love that one were too bad. I won't be in the one that leads to caution. Like that dude Jeremy said, don't stop believing, unless you dream stupid. Then you should get a better dream. I think that's how it goes. Get a better dream and keep going. Keep going, keep going, and keep going. What did Michael Jordan have quit? No, he did quit. No, he retired. Yeah, that's right. He retired. But before that, in high school, what if he quit when he didn't make the team? Who would have never made Space Jam? And I love Space Jam. What will be your Space Jam? What will you create will make the world awesome? Nothing if you keep sitting there. That's why I'm talking to you today. This is your time. This is my time. It's our time. We can make every day better for each other. If we're all on the same team, let's start acting like We got work to do. We can cry about it or we can dance about it. You are made to be awesome. Let's get out there. I don't know everything. I'm just a kid. But I do know this. Everybody do to give the world a reason to dance. So get to it. You just get to it. Create something that will make the world awesome. Play ball. Everybody. We're all working hard to make this an awesome year for other people. And you guys are doing it. You've been super encouraging to me. I want to return the faith. So you know we need some encouragement. Max just pepped on the wall and let's get the whole world to dance. I'm dedicating this video today to my friend Gabby. She's a cool kid. She likes playing games and she's fighting cancer like a boss. And to all you watching, so encourages you. Send them this video and let them know. So get to it. All right. That was awesome. That was. Oh, let's see. I got to stop sharing this. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Stop sharing. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Man, wasn't that cool? Be on the path that leads to awesome. So I put in the chat room the uh, the link to that video, and uh, I'm going to make that kid a regular appearance on my screen daily. So um, go back and rewatch that, you guys. All right, Devin Hubbard is on the call today. Devin, thanks so much for joining us, man. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Well, no, I really appreciate it, and I know uh, a lot of people on this call are going to get value out of that, and that's kind of the whole point of this call. And so I'm going to introduce you a little bit, but. Um, after I do my brief introduction, I want you to just give us a little bit more detail because uh, we know each other a little bit, right? But not like really, really well as maybe as I know some of the other guests. And, and so just a reminder why I'm doing these calls, they've been you know great for me and hopefully for others to highlight uh, both experienced investors, maybe people that are you know halfway in their investing life or people that are you know kind of up and coming. And today's gonna be no different with Devin. Um, these are kind of my way of, you know, hopefully giving back and making connections that maybe you didn't have in the past with, um, you know, someone that you didn't know that could add value, whether it's Devin, you know, meeting someone new or, or you guys meeting Devin and, and everybody learning and growing together. So Devin, a little bit more about Devin. Is it relatively new investor of seven years? Devin Hubbard has been learning and progressing first as an investor, which we'll talk about and, and flipper and wholesaler, then as an agent, and now moving on to even um, larger deals like multifamily and apartments. 
Uh, he's an extrovert and a people person who cherishes the friends um, made along the way, especially from those that he meets while investing in real estate. So Devin is 36 years old, married with five kids, and we're going to talk a little bit about that journey with his kids and his family. Born and raised in Utah, living in Weber and Davis County the whole time, other than two years when he was a missionary in Costa Rica. And so here we go, Devin, what did I miss? Tell us a little bit more about you and, you know, where you come from and, and how you're wired a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so uh, born and raised here in Utah. And uh, for a long time, I, I just felt like I was uh, the, the weird kid because I didn't want to go to school. And I didn't want to get the, the traditional education. I actually struggled quite a bit in school and hated, I, I hated school for a long time. Uh, the only thing I think that I liked about school was the friends and, and uh, the girls <laughs> and, and uh, gym class because I've always been a sports fan. And so anyway, for a long time, yeah, I, I, I graduated high school, went on a mission and then came back and, and worked for the LDS Church in their welfare program for almost 12 years. Really? Uh huh. And so I did that for a long time, and uh, I even did that for the last couple of years before I started doing uh, real estate full time. And so um, my wife and I have been married 12 years, and uh, I would say, yeah, for a long time I just I did the church employment thing. It was good. It was a safe, steady job, but I I. I wanted more and I wanted to be able to pick and choose when I went on vacation and I didn't want somebody to tell me when I could and couldn't be sick or when I was out of vacation leave. And so, uh, again, I felt like I was kind of the weird one because that just seemed like what that's just kind of our society today is get the safe nine to five job and, and save your money and put into your 401k and get good benefits and, and so for a long time, that's what I did. And then I got introduced to real estate. And I want to say it was like August of 2014 is kind okay. of when we made the jump. So, okay, cool. No, this is great. So uh, it sounds like a very conservative, probably not like rolling the dice in life very much, you know, up to 2014, you know, nine to five. I, I'm guessing, you know, working for the church welfare, that's not like a million dollar a year type position, you know, probably really. That's a very safe, yeah, that's a very safe bet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, very budget conscious, right? You and your wife, right? Like, you know, and so this is fascinating to me. I think everyone's real estate story is uh, so cool and different as to when someone makes that, that jump, right? That leap of like, okay, I'm going way outside my comfort zone and I'm kind of like, of leaving what had been super comfortable, but it, it sounds like something you sensed inside of you. Like this is not that that isn't good, right? Or like good for other people is a great opportunity for you to get to where you got. But what what made you kind of like, were, were there things that kind of fell into place or had you been thinking for a while before you met, you know, introduction to the Renatus, you know, real estate um, networking and education platform of like, man, is there something else out there? But how, like, I'm interested in kind of connecting those dots of like how you ended up, you know, finding that. Were you looking for it or did it find you? And, and then ultimately, how did you decide to act on that? Uh, I guess you could say a combination of both. Um, I, I, I always knew that I wanted to be a business owner. I always knew I wanted to get into real estate. Um, I, the funny thing is I actually took the real estate classes when I was dating my wife to become an agent and I bombed the test like a handful of times and I gave up. And this was really? like, so this was like 12 or 13 years ago. I Did bombed the test. Because you just weren't good at taking tests from growing up as well. Like you hated school. Maybe were you just not like a great student and it was intimidating or. Oh, uh, probably there's probably multiple factors, but yeah, that was probably one of many as I, I always, was uh, not the best test taker. But uh, yeah, thankfully, this last go around when I took the real estate test, I passed on my first try. Awesome. So yeah, luckily, and I, it probably helped that I had, you know, a handful of years on the investing side. 
to kind of learn the lingo and the terms and different things. And so I was obviously a lot more prepared this time around, but yeah, about 12 or 13 years ago, I, I couldn't pass that stupid test. And so I, I just kind of walked away and let life happen for whatever reason. And, and then I, so how I kind of fell into Renatus was, uh, it was like summer of 2014 and rich dad poor dad came into town and i went to one of their seminars and the guy sitting next to me was actually a part of renatus and i had no idea and i got done with this short little conference with a rich dad poor dad seminar and he kind of tapped me on the leg and he said hey are you like are you interested and i said yeah i'm actually really interested and he said i've got somebody you need to talk to and so he ended up introducing me to a handful of more people that were a part of Renatus here locally and and I kind of you could say investigated or whatever ch checked it out sure. for a few months and and uh, my wife and I bit the bullet in August of 2014 and and uh, we didn't really have a lot of money like you uh, like you said working for the church and I had we were literally just having our third kid at the time and uh, money was pr pretty tight. My wife was working or was a stay at home mom and it was just me on a tight budget. But uh, we ended up maxing out a few 0% credit cards to pay for the education. And uh, people asking me probably think that I'm crazy for doing it and maybe I am. But I also felt like that was me investing in myself and that was also me putting my feet to the fire realizing, you know, if I'm going to drop thousands of dollars on this education, I got to freaking do it and make it work. Well, so man, that, that is, that is really cool. I think back to the call that we had with, um, with Sterling Harris and I, he was just on the call, maybe his connection dropped off, but you know, he talked about how he was in that spot too, where he was basically dead broke, didn't have the money. Not that, um, not that he did Renatus, but just as far as to get into his first deal, uh, he joined a, he joined a group, the Smarter Real Estate Tribe with Mike Baird. And it was, it was kind of like, you know, you either burn the boats voluntarily or like, you know, the boats are burned on you and then you got to figure out, right, how to make it work. So, okay. So here you are, you're like, this is jiving with me. I want to get into real estate. You know, you met someone with Renatus. I know the Renatus buy-in, you know, could be anywhere up to like 20 grand. So you just, you just went for it, right? So you just enthusiastically, you and your wife are on the same page and, and you dove into the world of learning a little bit about more. So Renatus, if people don't know, it's a, well, why don't you tell just, this isn't a pitch or anything for them, but there's a lot of investors in the community that got their start one way or another with Renatus. And, and I guess the point is whether it's Renatus or something else, whether it's a formal school or mentoring with somebody, everybody needs a little bit of a push and a start to get going. And so I've seen a lot of people go through something like Renata. Some of them flail out big time, but a lot of them like you, Devin, picked up the fundamentals and the resources and the tools that you needed to ultimately become successful. So just briefly, what pick up where you left off. I didn't mean to cut you off, but so you guys get into Renata and, and, and take it from there. Like, you know, what first kind of deals you did, that kind of thing. Sure. So yeah, we, um, we were in our first house. Our first house was actually a house hack. And I guess that kind of help open my mind a little bit because it was a rambler 15, 1500 square feet up and down. And so our, I remember our mortgage payment at one point when we first got in was like around 1100 a month and we were getting like 850 a month just in renting the basement. And so I think that helped open my eye, my mind quite a bit to Holy smokes. Like this is pretty sweet. I'm barely, I'm not even paying what most people are paying for rent and I'm owning my house and building equity and, you know, so, um, but yeah, we, we paid at the time it was like 15 grand for two years of access to the Renatus education. And okay. that's uh, since changed a little bit. Now they do the lifetime access, which is nice. And we've upgraded to that, but, uh, yeah, we, we just dove in. They've got recorded trainings that you can watch. So I was working my nine to five during the day. My wife was a stay at home mom. So she was, um, she was watching classes at home while I was working. And then she would text me all sorts of stuff. Hey, we can do this and this and this um, on tax write-offs or set up your entity this way. Or, and so it was, 
it was a, I guess a tag team of both of us working together. And then at night we would put the kids to bed. We would, you know, have the laptop sitting, sitting on our laps and we would just watch the education at night um, for a couple hours. And, and so that's, that's kind of how we got started for quite a few months. And then we got, and so I, I learned about all of this stuff with Renatus before I got into any of the RIA groups and any of the, like the meetups and stuff that, that are nice and conveniently available to us. And so that's kind of how I got my start and I dove in and for the first few months, that's, it was just, you know, just sponging up as much as we could with education, meeting people, networking. And so Renatus has kind of that built in community of all the other students and people that are a part of the group. And so we just tried to be a part of as much as we could. And uh, the first deal we did, we just actually leveraged the HELOC that we had on our house as a down payment for our first rental as just a single family home. But I realized pretty quick after a few months that $300, $350 of cash flow wasn't very exciting. Yeah. Uh, especially, <laughs> especially because I was the landlord and I, I've realized that I'm too nice and I'm, I'm uh, too, uh, yeah, I guess you can just say leave it at too nice. And so I'm not the, probably the best landlord. Bad so enforcing, my lesson on. Yeah, enforcing yeah. things or payment. No, I get that. So yep. just kind of, pause and you know a lot of your story just reminds me of different things I've learned you know myself throughout life or or my investment journey there's a coaching program I I subscribe to and the founder Dan Sullivan talks about the four C's and when you talked about your you know your your journey getting started into real estate it reminded me of these four C's which are commitment courage capability and confidence and usually this cycle starts with the first C of commitment right? Like you guys committed and your story's cool because you're on the same page with your wife, right? Like you're hustling during the day at work. You're kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel of like house hacking your current house. Your wife's on the same page. You guys are learning together. You're burning the midnight oil, like first educating yourself, right? So when you first commit, sometimes you don't have the courage, right? But once you commit, then you develop the courage, right? Like I'm sure when you, you know, put that 0% credit card, you're like, crap, I'm scared to death, right? But then it kind of gives you the courage and then you get capabilities, which is what you're talking about now, right? You started to learn and like a sponge, you start learning more about entities, tax, tax, tax strategies, how to buy your first, you know, rental, why maybe that rental doesn't make sense to manage yourself. And then ultimately you develop confidence, right? And so think about this just in life in general, but as you talk about your story, I bet you anything, this cycle is going to keep repeating itself, commitment, courage, capability, and then confidence. And you get that flywheel going. And then this is going to be cool to see how where we end up here in the next 40 minutes, right? Like, because ultimately, I would bet if you could go back in time where you're like, wow, I'm putting together an apartment deal. You never in your life would have thought that in 2013, right? Oh, yeah, no way. So this no is way. awesome. So sorry to cut you off. So, so, so your first deal you did was a rental deal while along the way, you're still just introduced to all of this through Renatus and their coaching and there I know they have weekly meetings and stuff like that right so 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 your first deal was that so you used your home equity line of credit again another reminder have good credit have good resources if you don't have the money for it you can tap into your own piggy bank you know and I've done that recently through leveraging some of my rentals and stuff like that so and Tim Watke talked a lot about that on his call about how he's always re-leveraging some of his properties to come up with new monies for the next property so so uh, anyway, pick it up from there. I just was wanted to add some commentary there to your story. No, no, you're good. Um, so yeah, our, our first deal was a rental and I learned fairly quick that uh, it wasn't super exciting, just that three or 350. And I, I realized too, you get into rentals for the long-term thing, but yeah. I, was, I, I was looking for a way out of my job and a way to free myself from debt and just, you know, get into real estate full time. And that 300, 350 bucks a month wasn't, wasn't really cutting it. And so a short time later, um, we got into our first flip and uh, kind of quick story about that. Um, it was a lady, it was a widow that was in our neighborhood who had passed away. And as soon as I found out, I was like, oh, this is probably, you know, a great opportunity to maybe find our first flip deal. 
And so I literally just wrote a hand letter just saying, sorry for your loss. You're, you know, a good lady. And we got to know her for quite a bit over a few years. And we just said, if you have any interest in selling the property, we would love, you know, we'd love to buy it. And they actually called us. We just, I just left it, literally left it in their mailbox, a handwritten letter. And one of the sons called us that same day just saying, hey, we're actually looking to sell it. So we found a time to go look at it. They were wanting, and these numbers probably sound crazy now, but it was a single family home, about 1,400 square feet, three bed, one bath. And they were wanting 125 for it. This was a, obviously a couple of years ago, which you can't find anything for 125. And uh, those numbers didn't work for me at the time. So I just said, I'd have to be in that 105 to 110 range to honestly be able to pick it up and for you know my partner to be willing to lend on it. And so I just kind of left that offer on the table and they called me back about two weeks later and said, hey, are you still interested? And so anyway, we ended up getting it for 105. And at that time, I actually had a couple of hard money lenders kind of fighting for the deal. And I, you know, having my first deal, I wasn't, I was learning and I, you know, I wasn't this experienced guy. So I, I actually had one uh, hard money lender say, Hey, I'll give you seven grand to basically walk away, you know, just wholesale the deal to him. And he said, but I know you'll make a lot more if you flip it yourself. And so when he told me that I said, Oh, this is a guy that I can trust if he's willing to tell me that. I'm, you know, I'm willing to use him for hard money. And uh, anyway, we ended up putting about 20 into it and we walked away with about 26 grand net on that one. And that was a game changer, you know, for us with, well, uh, I mean, you know, deal. not getting into details, I would bet that was sniffing pretty close to like what you were used to making in a full year at your prior job. Right. I mean, pretty, that, dark, I mean, that Pretty was close. probably about five months. Yeah, that was probably close. Like at the time, it was probably five or six months of income. And from the time we bought it till the time we sold it was less than 90 days. That's and all. So yeah, that was a game changer for us. So again, just again, this is more for me, a, a learning moment. Um, you know, Leith Lovata, who I had on this call, he kind of kept saying in his call, what's the next right thing you can do, right? And so again, it's also point of these calls is to find one thing where you can act on and take action and and make a difference and so there's probably something that all of us have thought this last week like oh man if I would have sent this like think of the coulda woulda shoulda if you just wouldn't have gotten over whatever self-consciousness or whatever about sending a mailer to that family or dropping that note in the mailbox right like so again you went you, you took action you took action based off of the stuff that you had learned and you committed to do that. And then it turned out to be an awesome thing. And it continued to kind of keep that momentum going where you could see, wow, if I can pick up a deal this way and I can put it together and make 26,000, like, oh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel here. Like you just said, right? That was like a big switch that went off about now I can get it. When you started this segment, you know, your mind was looking for a way to get out of your job. Right. And I often think that when you set your mind to something, whether you know it or not, you're going to find it, whether that's something good or bad, but you had that in your head. Right. So, so, uh, so where'd you go from there? You know, I know you said you kind of did a lot of wholesale and, and flips, you know, for the next few years, but you're also still working at your other job, right? Yeah. So it's been probably about two and a half years since I walked away from my job to do real estate full time. Awesome. And that, that last year, the funny thing is I was the one wanting initially to get out of my job to do real estate full time. By the time it came down to it, it was actually my wife telling me, Hey, it's time for you to quit your job. And it was me almost hesitating because I knew how big of a responsibility that was and how big of a deal that was once I actually, you know, put in my two weeks to walk away from that security blanket. Yep. And so the, the cool thing is, like you said, I've had, my wife's support from day one, and uh, that's always been been huge. Um, I love her and appreciate her incredibly for that. And so she's been a huge cheerleader, and you know I definitely couldn't have done it without her. Um, but yeah, it was that last year. It was actually 
December of 2017, I think, if I remember right, that, uh, you know, like December 1st, I think was when I put in my two weeks. And that year we made twice as much in real estate part-time as I had made full-time at my job or yeah, working full-time at my nine to five job. That's awesome. So thinking back, if you can, over those first, some of the emotions and the anxiety and the stress fade a little bit after you've had a little success. But um, I want to talk for a minute as well, if, if it's an okay time to do this, because it sounds like this is kind of like a pivotal point where you really made up your mind. You'd had some experience where you knew it was going to work, but you're also still dealing with the stress of like, you know, raising a family, um, not to shift gears completely, but if you think if it's an okay time, I want to learn a little bit more. I think you have a unique, t talk a little bit about where you're at with your family right now and kids and, and your family desires at this point in time. Yeah. Um, so my wife's always struggled with, with infertility stuff. And so we're extremely blessed to have, uh, we've got five, we've adopted one and the other four we've had, but we've always, you know, we've always had to have I guess what you call medical help or special help to to get those other four here. And so we're, yeah, we're very blessed and, and grateful to have the ones that we do. Um, but yeah, when I was dating my wife, um, when we first met, we, I was actually before we actually seriously started dating, I told her I've always wanted to adopt a little black boy. And, and she said, she didn't tell me this at the time, but she said, that's when I knew we were going to get married because she had that same desire, mm -hmm. but, um, she realized not many guys are probably in that same boat. So for both of us to have that same desire and, and want to adopt, um, that was, that was pretty cool. So knowing that we've always wanted to adopt, um, yeah, Michaela is our oldest and she'll be 10 next month. And then we had Daxton, who will be eight next month. And then Carter is six. And we didn't ever do anything to prevent getting pregnant with any of them. And so we went, you know, almost six years until we've had this one. And so knowing that we've always wanted to adopt, um, about two years ago, we realized, you know, we're, we're not old, but we're not getting any younger. And yeah, so right. we decided hey if we're gonna if we're gonna look into this adoption thing we probably ought to get serious and so um and so yeah we we worked things out uh we were actually working with a 16 year old birth mom here locally and we were a part of her pregnancy for the last six months and she gave birth and we were actually lined up to go pick it up from the hospital and uh the influence of her her mom actually she ended up keeping it and so we, we, you know, we, we thought we had a baby coming into the home and it turned out literally about 12 hours before we were supposed to pick it up, we found out it wasn't going to work out. And, and so that and, was kind of... And you have already had four kids so far, right? That you're, uh, you're working on your fifth or three. Okay. You're, you're working yeah. on four. You've had three. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so that, yeah, that fell through literally last minute and, uh, so at that point, we kind of took a break for a few months. And uh, anyway, never in a million years did we think we'd become foster parents. But uh, that's kind of, you know, kind of the path we went down. And so we became certified foster parents uh, February of last year. And literally April 19th, uh, Grayson was born on a Friday night and we got a phone call from DCFS Saturday morning saying, hey, this little baby boy was born last night. Basically, he's yours if you want him. And wow. so, um, yeah, it was literally overnight we became almost parents again. Um, and so it actually went back and forth for quite a few months. And then in January of this year, uh, his mom signed her rights away. And so we literally just adopted him legally uh, like six weeks ago, June 3rd, we adopted Grayson into our family. So. Dude, congrats. That is so awesome. You guys sound like amazing parents to take that on. And then <laughs> did you just have another natural, like. We did. Yeah. Well? So that's, that's always how it works. You know, you, you adopt, you find out you're going to adopt and then you learn that you're, you're pregnant at the same time. So yeah, my wife just delivered number five about 
yeah, it's been three weeks now. So number four and number five are only about 14 months apart. So it's, uh, it's been quite the, the uh, circus at our house, but it's, it's fun. Wow. We're yeah. Glad. You don't have too much going on that. Holy cow. Well, <laughs> what a cool story. The other thing I wanted to ask you, cause you posted about this. Um, what were you doing with the DNA kit? This is why I want to ask you a little bit more about it. One, I think it's fascinating. I think you guys are so amazing for doing that and taking care of, you know, bringing in, a, a, you know, someone else into your home and having them be your kid. Uh, but what, what were you doing with the DNA kit? Are you trying to find out a little bit more about the genetics or the history or whatever? Of, yeah. Of breaking? yeah, so that's, that's the interesting thing is we met his mom and uh, we, we got to know her fairly well but we have no idea who no idea who his dad is and so we um when we adopted him the the state actually gives you almost as much information as they have access to uh -huh. and so not not first to take copies home but just to kind of scan through these books and you can scan through them and uh so we we understood that his mom was half caucasian half mexican but we had no idea who Grayson's dad was and he's never been in the picture and never apparently from what the mom says, never wanted to be in the picture because she's the mom's 20, like 28 years old. And this is kid number five for her. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, so anyway, we wanted to do this DNA test to really find out, you know, where, where he came from and what other, you know, ethnicities and stuff might, might come. And so we wanted to find out where he came from and, you know, who, who he was and where he came from exactly. So. That's awesome. Well, good luck with all of that. I wanted to kind of highlight that to, you know, one, you know, maybe someone needed to hear that part of your story, right? I was definitely interested in it, but it also goes to show you have a lot going on with like a new career, right? Like, you know, you're, you're, you're just leaving your comfort zone of your nine to five, you're getting hot and heavy full-time in real estate, but you're also, uh, you're also not, you know, lacking from the personal life of, of uh, complicating things in a positive way, right? But, so that's awesome. So as it sits right now, you have five kids, two of them are, you know, two years or younger. You just got a heck of a household going there. And then the journey with Grayson will be awesome. Hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll find out a little bit more about him where he came from and that'll continue to be a cool journey for you guys. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, cool. A little sidetrack because I wanted to, you know, again, the whole point is called know a little bit more about Devin and what motivates you as well. Um, so you've been flipping, wholesaling, creating relationships with other partners that will help you. What are some of the ways, I mean, you know, a lot of these are maybe elementary for, for a lot of people on this call, but what are some of the ways that you found success in finding deals other than do you do a lot of personal marketing or direct to seller or like how have you been able to network or where, where do you get your deals from? I would say uh, the majority of my deals are, you know, networking, sphere of influence, social media. Um, I've taken jabs. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've really done any mailers or cold calling. Um, I've been very fortunate I guess to avoid that, but uh, you know, you they always say you can even either dedicate your time or your money into marketing, and so I've I guess I've done a lot of dedication of you know marketing with my time when it comes to networking and uh, uh, yeah on the marketing side with networking and just I've for a long time it felt like I, if there was ever any real estate meeting within an hour of where I was at, I was almost always going to that meeting. And that's, that's obviously slowed down a little bit more with, with uh, things picking up in on the agent side and with, you know, kids and stuff. But yeah, for a long time, it, saying, it seemed like if there was ever any type of real estate opportunity to learn and network, I was always there. That's, so yeah. for, you know, many years, that's what I was doing. Yeah, there's uh there's no free lunch, right? You either got to pay for it or you got to work for it. And I, I echo a lot of that as well. I've, I haven't really ever spent too much money on direct to seller marketing. Like I know Luke's on the call right now. Uh, Luke's done a, a lot of direct to seller marketing and not only putting forth the effort and the man hours, but also the dollars. But I've relied a lot, kind of like you, Devin, on relationships. 
being in the room, networking, rubbing shoulders, calling people on the phone, this or that. And I know you're really active on social media. Sterling Harris was on the call and he talked about a lot of the success he's had from being on social media is, and it sounds like a lot of this is your personality, but do you have, are you, do you follow like more of a formal way of, of getting deals from social media or is it just you being you posting? I know you post a variety of stuff, family stuff, personal interest stuff, religious stuff, whatever. Is it coordinated at all or is it just kind of Devin being Devin and, and kind of like your letter when you left it in the, the, the neighbor's mailbox, like, hey, this is also what I do if I can help in any way type thing? Yeah, so I, I don't really have, you know, a specific strategic agenda. It's just, you know, 100% Devin. Um, for, for a while I was paying, I, I guess for a while I was paying a thousand bucks, 1500 bucks for somebody to manage some of my stuff. And it felt like it wasn't, you know, obviously nobody's going to do it the same way you do it yourself. Yeah. And, and so I realized after about six months that it was something that I could do. And, you know, for the money that I could save, I felt like I would probably get better results if I were to just do it myself. And so, yeah, the last probably six months, it's just six, nine months. It's probably just been me learning the ropes and, and, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just me being me, I guess. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's another reminder. There's, there's deals out there for all of us and, and there's probably deals that only I would get. There's probably deals that only you would get, right? There's maybe a bunch of deals that everyone has access to, right? Whether it's on the MLS and if you're hustling and working hard you get there first, but but, but I think that that rings true to me quite a bit too, is, you know, you just, you be you, be authentic, you know, keep learning and growing and, you know, you're going to add value where you add value and you're going to be in the right place at the right time because it's, you know, I don't know, like maybe some people won't believe in this. It's meant to be for you, right? Like you're supposed to do something yeah. with that. And so I think you've done a really good job of that. So do you, do you think going forward, you'll maybe kind of refine that a little bit. I mean, there's you being you, but you can also be you being you in a little bit more organized or somewhat of a strategic way. Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm actually looking to utilize a, a virtual assistant more for, you know, utilizing those lists of seller, you know, motivated sellers. And so I mean, instead of relying more on just 100% of, you know, my SOI and my network and things, um, growing up in Weber and Davis County, almost, I would say 80 to 90% of my deals are Weber Davis County, which is great because they're close to home, but I, I don't want to miss out on opportunities that might be, you know, right around the corner from, from home. So, um, yeah, I'm looking at, at hiring a virtual assistant that I can, you know, rely on to help set appointments and kind of realize with, you know, five kids, you've got to be extra careful and, and, uh, and uh, meaningful with your time management. So um, trying, yeah, trying to dial that in for sure is, is gonna be crucial. But yeah, you hiring a virtual assistant with cold calling, helping set appointments and things as you know, my next step and focus actually right now, so. Awesome, well, if anyone listening on the call feels like that's kind of a skill set for them, I've dropped Devin's number and we'll drop it in at the end. You reach out, you know, like in, in see if there's a connection there to help. Um, I don't know if Jaden maybe has one or, or Luke obviously might have some, you know, referrals down that way. So, okay, awesome. So that's great. So this last maybe, you know, 18, 20 minutes, I kind of want to like follow your progression here, right? Like starting just to recap, like LDS employee, church service employee at the welfare, you know, like grinding out the nine to five, take the leap, buy in to start learning more about real estate, start actually doing deals. Now you're to the point where you're making more money than you were with your nine to five. You've kind of left that rat race and you're working on getting out of the overall life rat race, right? Like rich dad, poor dad, we talk about. And so what have you done? What I want to kind of hit on is, you know, your progression. Then, you know, the light switch went on about, I need to be more in control about what I'm doing. I'm going to get my license. And then let's kind of end with your apartment deal. Right. And so Talk about how your mind is shifting as far as like rerounding back to getting your license, how that's helped you. And then we'll, we'll go into the, uh, you know, your apartment deal and how you came into that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, 
I realized a couple years into real on the real estate investing side of you know wholesaling and flipping that uh, I was leaving a lot of money and opportunity on the table by not having my real estate license. And some people are against it. Some people are all for it. That's you know that's okay. Everybody's different. But I decided um, <laughs> to bite the bullet. You know I, I mentioned earlier that uh, when I was dating my wife I bombed the the test multiple times and so it was you know it took some courage and swallowed some pride a little bit to to try and do that process over again taking all those classes and things and so um uh i decided yeah to, to take the classes and luckily and thankfully uh, i passed the test on the first try but uh, yeah that was august of 2018 when i got my real estate license and to to get started i i just figured it was more not to sound selfish but it was more for my own benefit than yeah. to really become an agent and you know help other people um but i was always more than happy to uh you know to help somebody else buy and sell i didn't want to you know um uh, you know leave that um by the wayside and so anyway people were saying hey you know i realize you're in real estate can I help you, you know, can you help me buy or sell? We're looking to buy or sell. And I was always referring them to somebody else. So finally, I ended up getting my license. And again, it was to kind of get started more for my own benefit. But, you know, two years later, now I'm, you know, I'll probably, I'm on line to probably do 25, 30 deals as an agent this year for other people. And so it's, it's, it's turned into a huge way for me to make uh, a pretty good income just by being being an agent and also you know for my own my own deals and a lot of my deals have actually come from other agents that know I'm an investor and yeah. so that's actually been a huge a huge benefit for me over the last handful of years is um, you know agents realizing hey Devin's willing to let me represent him as the buyer so they you know I want them to be rewarded and incentivized for bringing me deals. So even though I'm an agent now, they're, you know, they're making that buying agent commission for bringing me deals if it works out. So that's actually been a good benefit as well. Oh, I think that's awesome. And it's a huge value add, like you said to yourself, new people that get investing, ask me all the time, should I get my license? And I agree again with you hundred percent, even if at the first, it's just selfishly to be able to control the MLS to control the data you're seeing to control your research and comping and then to save money on listing and buying, right? But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer, get your license, be in as much control as you can, unless you're at the point where you're scaling so much that you have a partner that's an agent that, you know, they, you can delegate a little bit. And then your other point, you're going to be so successful as you continue to grow out your team just because of your personality, right? Like your personality really leads to also being an agent, people having confidence in you. And, you know, final note to kind of concur with what you're saying, my last, I think four flips, my last four deals came from other agents. And there are other agents that maybe didn't quite have the resources to pull off the deal at the time. But the key, like you said, is I, you know, it's very clear that they're getting paid to pass that off. It's not just like, you know, so, you know, I paid them a full equivalent of the commission or call an assignment fee or wholesale fee or something like that. But anyway, so yeah, my last three deals came from agents as well. And, you know, so, all right, we're, uh, we could go for hours here, but I want to, you know, kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And I know your tunnel still has miles and miles to go. It'll be so awesome to see all the different things you do in your progression, but talked about how you got comfortable getting involved. You know, did you start thinking, I want to do more multi-units? Like, you know, you're just always progressing, right? Like I want to get into real estate. I want to do my own deals. Maybe I get my license. Where's your head now? And talk about some of these recent bigger projects that you're working on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, my first rental was a single family home cash flow on a couple hundred bucks. And uh, that wasn't overly exciting to me. And then last year I got into a seller finance fourplex and I'm actually in the process of flipping that. We close on that this week. And awesome. so, um, that, that will be a good deal, but I've realized like the cash flow that I want is going to be, you know, 30 units, 50 units, a hundred units, whether it's apartments or storage units, like 
I want ten thousand dollars of cash flow a month from from an you know an asset, not a couple hundred dollars a month. And so I realized I'd rather have one huge income producing asset than 30 small ones. And maybe, and maybe that's putting all your bait, your, you know, your eggs in one basket, but I kind of made that decision and uh, I can accredit, I guess I can thank people like Tyler Kohler and, and other guys that are doing these types of deals for, you know, helping me think bigger. And so, um, I've built a relationship being, I guess, living in South Ogden the last 12 years, I've built a relationship with quite a few of the employees over at South Ogden City. And uh, long story short, we met with the city quite, quite a few months ago. This was probably last summer, last fall. And we're just kind of talking about what the city would like to see happen with the land that's available and people that you know are wanting to maybe sell and different things going on and what their the city's goals were and um, and he pointed out a piece of property that was by McKady Hospital that said this was approved for a hotel and they got their franchise for this hotel to be built but the same franchise ended up selling uh, a a franchise to Weber State University, probably just within like a few months. And so the landowners realized there's no way we can compete putting a hotel here if the same franchise is doing one, you know, literally like a block or two away on, on Weber State's campus or right on top of it. And so they ultimately decided to sell. So we found this land available before it ever, it ever hit the market. So the People with the city gave us the, the contact information of the property owners and we reached out to him. He sent us over to his agent and we just kind of worked things out. And uh, funny thing is when we first started kind of looking into this property and doing our due diligence, we were thinking we were maybe going to get 40 to 45 units on this property. And so we were, it was looking tight. And then, um, we got to the point where we were thinking, oh, we can probably do 60 to 65 units on it after working with our engineer and architect. So anyway, long story short, we got uh, a partner involved that was willing to cover the cost of the land and all the improvements to get it entitled and things. And so um, we closed on the land. Uh, we got it under contract December of last year, and then we ended up closing on it I don't remember the exact time, but it was like April or May we closed on it. And uh, now we've involved uh, our general contractor and he, we had him look at it and his bread and butter is multifamily. That's all him and his partner do. And they probably built 17, 1800 units in the last handful of years for themselves and for you know, other developers. And so they know the ins and outs of multifamily probably just as good as anybody else that I've met. And so they looked at our project and they said, hey, we can do this and this and this. Now we can get 104 units on it. And we were initially hoping to get 40 to 60. So now it's got some podium parking and we got through the city to approve. We did a development agreement with the city approved and so, yeah, it's, it's uh, two levels of podium parking with four levels of housing above it with a mix of studios, one bed and two bed, and, you know, grand total of about 104 units on it. That, that is but so yeah, cool. It's, it's been quite the process. So it all started just from you poking around networking in a sense, right, at the city, finding out yep. what they needed or what they saw as an opportunity and then you jumped on it. That is so cool. So your team that you have now, did you have them all in place from the get go? I know your general contractor, you didn't, but like your, your, your money source that ended up funding the deal or was it just kind of like, did you just continue to network, ask for referrals or whatever, get to know people and like that thing that we talked about, right? Like, you know, I said the four C's are going to come back, right? You, you, committed to go in and do this, right? You found the courage, capability, and confidence, right? So you kind of put that all together. Um, how did you find those people? Were they all there up front or did you kind of just find them along the way? 
Yeah, so initially it was just me and a business partner that, uh, you know, we had the goal to get into, we, we found a specific area in South Ogden that had the zoning that we were looking for, and luckily we found it, but uh, yeah, it was just kind of, we were knocking doors here and there, and, but yeah, it was just, it started out with the, just the two of us, and uh, luckily he had a relationship with our capital partner on the deal who, you know, covered the acquisition of the land and entitlements and things, and, you know, I, I still question what the heck I'm doing. You know, I, it's so new to me that I'm learning everything that I know now has been because of this project. Yeah. Like I relationships with engineers, relationships with architects and learning the ins and outs of, you know, what, what's required from the city. And, and so luckily I've just had a handful of people along the way that, you know, that, uh, knows what they're doing and like you said it's just the importance of building a team and the networking and you know just being willing to ask questions and and be patient and uh yeah it's slowly built up that confidence and commitment for sure so that is awesome so fast forward what do you see how do you see this benefiting you that initial kind of like just talking with the city, when you see this, you know, fast forward two years, one year, whatever it is, when you're all stabilized, what, what do you guys project the value of this building to be? So we're probably looking at about 15 to 16 million. Um, and we're hoping it's probably, and again, we're still working out numbers. We're, we're still working with banks and stuff now, but um, once it's fully stabilized, we're hoping it's right around 20 to 22 million or obviously there's so many different factors that can change, but, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at probably 20 to 22 million. And what do you think your cash flow might be at the end of the day once that thing is stabilized? Um, we're looking at probably close to 30 grand or so. Awesome. That's a little bit better than 300, right? And I know you're not keeping all of that, but point is, is yeah. that is so cool. Okay, yeah. so you've got that going on. You've got your new, uh, I know you should just switch brokerages. So you got a lot of momentum with your retail um, side of the real estate. Are you building out a team there? Or, I mean, you can only do so much, right? How are you approaching the agent work? Are you, you know, I, I guess to kind of wrap up, where, like, you're a big vision guy, right? Like, you always kind of knew you were going to have a chance at, you know, making a difference in, in kids' lives by having them, but also adopting them. You know, you know, you saw the bigger vision of bigger cash flow. You kind of catching the vision of being an agent, being a investor, like give us two to three minutes to end. Like, where are you, where do you see yourself going? Um, this last year, I've definitely realized the importance and how crucial it is to, you know, leverage um, anybody that's probably been in the, the game for a while realizes that. And so I'm realizing that I want other solid agents around me that I can trust, that I can gladly give referrals out to, and just building, building a team and not necessarily that they have to work for me, but just somebody that I can gladly work with and say, hey, take this off my plate. And, you know, and so having that system with with you know a solid team of agents um and virtual assistants that are you know kind of that lead flow um but yeah i'm i'm wanting to continue with more developing more investing um and i i don't i don't know if i just have one straight path i've I, I jokingly call it uh, squirrel syndrome. I like, you know, where one thing catches your attention and then two seconds later, another thing catches your attention. Um, I probably, I need to hone that in a little bit better, but I, I don't have just one set thing that I, I, I want to do. Um, I, I have a lot of different goals and, and aspirations when it comes to real estate, business, and, and other things long-term, but um, yeah, but just being able to build up that cash flow and having, um, you know, like you said earlier, escaping the rat race. If I, you know, I, I feel fairly confident in the next two to three years, there's no reason why that shouldn't be 
should be the case, if not sooner. But I, and I'm the type of person too. Like I said, I'm a I'm a relationship person, extrovert. Even my wife said, even if we were making a million dollars a month, I would still be out doing real estate and yeah. meeting people and doing what I'm doing now. So I don't think much would really change too much. Awesome. I, I'm sure I would travel more and hang out with kids more, and which, um, luckily, you know, the the lifestyle that to real estate has blessed us with is gives us that a lot of those liberties now. But I think we would, yeah travel more and and long for longer durations of time you know with with even those other those other goals so well you're gonna get there and this has been so great to learn a little bit more about you and to just really be energized to you know for me anyway to realize that you know you, you, you've never kind of got there but you're also enjoying enjoying it along the way right and it's cool to create and and achieve and grow and and whatever so i mean you've you've probably got a gazillion things to do now you know like so i appreciate you taking the call today for an hour and if anyone i dropped your phone number reach out to devin if you can help him in any way or if you feel like he can help you and um good luck and all you do i can't wait to catch up with you you know hopefully more regularly but also in two or three years to see exactly where you've gone i'm sure it's going to be to you know huge heights so thanks again devin and best of luck in everything you're doing Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure there's a couple of diapers I could change right now. So there you go. Yeah, you better go get after it. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining. Appreciate it.